Hello everyone and welcome to our first of our nutrition section lectures. I've split this one into three different sections because there's so much to cover on nutrition and it is a topic students are often interested in learning about the most. So our first one is going to cover kind of the scientific basis of nutrition, the foundational knowledge that you'll need. Our second will cover the psychology around eating which is equally, if not more, important for healthy eating. And finally, the last one will cover some practical application tips that you can use to put it to good use. So let's dive in. Today we're going to cover the concept of what it means to eat well, what is calorie balance, why it's important, and how you might figure it out. We'll look at macronutrients, things in your food that you need a lot of, micronutrients, things in you, your food that you also need but aren't as uh, needed in as large of quantities, and then we'll look at sugar and trans fats and where those are found in your food and what impact they have. So the first thing to consider before we even dive into talking about food is the idea or the question of what does it mean to eat well? or to eat healthy. And a lot of times when I talk to students right here about their goals for the semester, much of what they say is I wanna eat better or I'm gonna lose weight by eating healthy. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what that means. And it likely means something different for everyone. And while many of us do know kind of the general guidelines around what it means to eat healthy, the application of which is often challenging and, and diverges. So these are just kind of some pictures depicting different meanings or different ways that it might look like for someone to eat healthy. So this upper left says body, mind, soul, spirit. So we can eat in a way that nourishes these things. So eating well to you might mean building a healthy body, having healthy mind and brain function, and food can certainly do that. Um, and having a healthy spirit and or soul. So food can impact our health on a variety of levels. If you're really interested in that, you might look up a concept called epigenetics and specifically um, nutri, nutri epigenetics and how our nutrition affects the expression of our genome. That's what the second picture depicts here. That's a double helix DNA strand made out of food. So yes, our food has a profound impact on our health and well-being down to the molecular level. So eating more fruits and vegetables like you see here turns off genes from expressing that would increase the risk of developing cancer, for example. So that's one way foods can impact our health. This next one is the idea that eating well might have a cultural connotation for you and it might look different depending on what culture or ethnic group or um, background you come from and so that's a consideration when you're thinking about what it means to eat well for you bottom left we just have a group of people eating together and oftentimes we forget that food is a social activity for many of us and it is designed to be that way. In fact, when we look at some of the healthiest countries in the world, we see that they spend a long time dining. So places like Spain, Italy, France, where um, compared to our food science findings here in the US, we might consider that they don't have a very healthy diet, right? In France, they eat a lot of pastries, croissants, cheeses, wine, in Italy, they eat a lot of pasta and pizza. In Spain, they eat a lot of cured meats, right? So these are not things that we consider very healthy here, and yet all of these countries have better health profiles than our citizens in the U.S. do. And part of that reason is that they enjoy the social aspect of eating, which changes everything from how much we enjoy our food to how much of it we eat to our digestive response. And that we'll talk more about in our next section. And then finally, I have on here the a picture that depicts the environmental aspect of what it means to eat well. And for many people, this is um, an important consideration when determining what to eat and how healthy it is, not just how it affects our internal environment, like our health and well-being, 
but our external environment, that of which we live in. And so some people make the decision to eat or not eat certain foods because of the impact it has on our environment, which affects all of our health and well-being. There are certainly many more ways that eating, that foods and nutritions can impact our health, our happiness, our, our longevity, and that of the environment and the people around us. But these are just a few examples. And I put this here first because a lot of times when we go into a view of health, we have a very myopic focus just on the nutrients. And today is big on nutrients, but I wanna say that that's not the whole picture. So a very prominent food journalist named Michael Pollan came up with this term called nutritionism. Nutritionism. And he writes that in the past 50 years or so, the U.S. has become increasingly focused on the scientific stuff that's in our food, the molecules that are in our food. So the macronutrients that we'll get into in a minute, the carbs, proteins, and fats, and the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals, how much of these foods we need and how we can get them in their diet and in what quantities. And then we'll isolate these specific compounds. We'll put them into pills and supplements. And the paradoxical thing that is, is that in this time that we've been focusing more on the nutrients in our food, our health as a country has been declining. So all that is to say that sometimes more information around the science of nutrition doesn't actually make us healthier. And that's why we have the two lessons after this on the psychology of eating and the practical application. And so I want you to consider all of this in a broad context. If you were to eat the perfect diet with the widest array of fruits and veggies and, and lean meats and healthy foods at every meal and snack, but that caused a sacrifice or a reduction in your emotional health, or in your relationships because you couldn't go out and enjoy food with your friends, would that actually make you healthier? Something to consider. So I encourage you to t spend some more time pondering this topic. What does it mean to eat well? What does healthy eating mean to you? So looking at some of the specifics around food as a fuel source. So food does provide all the fuel our body needs to function in the form of what we call a calorie with a capital C. I'm quite confident that most of you have heard of the word calorie before, maybe in the context of not having too many. It's often how we hear of it now. Um, but in fact, we do need calories and we do need a baseline amount of them to survive and thrive. So our intent should not be to get the smallest amount of calories we can to still function. <laughs> So what is a calorie? Well, one gram calorie, this is lowercase c, is, the, is a unit of energy, so the amount of energy in food that will increase the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Woo, exciting stuff. When we have 1,000 of those gram calories, we call it a capital C calorie, a big calorie. So that's what a calorie is. That's how the measurement comes. They put a food in something called a bomb calorimeter. They burn it, and then they measure how much the temperature of water increases. And that's how they find how many calories are supposedly in your food. And that's what they'll have on food package labels. Um, but one thing to consider is that the way your food burns, literally, in a bomb calorimeter is not the same way that it burns in your body, or my body, or your friend's body. And in fact, if we were all three to eat an apple of the same size, we would all three extract different amounts of calories from it based on our genetics, on our metabolism, on the bacteria that live in our belly, on whether that apple was cooked or not, um, like into a pie or a strudel. So lots of things will impact the amount of calories that we get on a food, in a food. And so while we will talk about calories today, I do want to say that this is not a precise measure, that determining how many calories you need per day with an equation is an estimate, and determining how many calories you get is the same. So if you do, which I have you do in your next assignment, if you do track calories using an app like MyFitnessPal, know that that 
has about a 30% margin of error. And oftentimes it's that people are under reporting the amount of calories they eat. So that means if you regularly report that you're getting 2000 calories a day, if you're 30% under, you may actually be getting 2600 calories a day. So not a perfect science, but sometimes useful. And then all of the calories that we get come from these three macronutrients. And macro, think big, macronutrients means things that we need a lot of in our diet. The three macronutrients are carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And you can see an example of some of these foods in the pictures below. There's an overlap for some, where some foods like beans and grains will have both carbohydrates and protein. Some foods like dairy, eggs, and fish will have both protein and fat. And some foods fall more squarely into their own categories. Generally speaking, fruits and vegetables, grains like pasta, potatoes, bread, um, are going to fall squarely in the carbohydrate category. Foods like meat and fish, most fish, are going to fall squarely in the protein category. Foods like avocados, seeds, oils, olives are going to fall squarely in the fat category. And then you'll have some things that fall in between. So foods that have some protein and fat are going to be like your full fat dairy products, eggs, nuts, peanut butter, etc. Foods that fall in between your carbohydrate and protein category will be beans, legumes, and some grains. And foods are typically classified by the macronutrient they have the most of. So while beans do have some protein, they're going to have more carbohydrate, so they're typically going to be classified as a carb. While cheese does have some protein, it's going to have more fat, so it's typically going to be classified as a fat. Cool. So some more things to know about your macronutrients. They all offer a different amount of calories, which they're referring to as kcal here, which is just another way to um, write that capital C calorie, because that's a thousand small calories. K stands for kilo, kilocalorie. So kcal, so per gram, per amount of that food. So a one gram of carbohydrate is going to offer four calories for your body. One gram of protein is also going to offer four calories per your body. So carbohydrates and protein are equivalent in the amount of calories that they offer based on a serving size. So that that in that way, like a big handful of rice will yield a similar amount of calories to the same size amount, like a palm size of chicken. Um, fat, if you look to the bottom, is going to be twice as calorically dense with nine calories per gram. So that's why when you think of things like peanut butter and olive oil, you get big amounts of calories for small amounts of food. So two tablespoons of peanut butter, which is like the size of two dice, is 190 calories. Whereas that same amount of bread, you know, a couple side, couple dice, would probably be 50 calories, right? So fat is going to offer us a lot more calories per gram, but that doesn't mean it's a bad food. So this was thought in the 90s when people realized this, they thought, oh, well, fat gives us more calories, so it must be bad. But as you'll see soon, fat has so many important roles in our bodies. It's not true. Alcohol also offers calories at seven calories per gram. And despite the fact that it offers calories, it's not considered a macronutrient because contrary to what you may or may not believe, we don't have to consume it. <laughs> so alcohol is not technically a macronutrient, but it still provides calories. So you can see on the side here, this comparison, one teaspoon of sugar gives us five grams of carbohydrate. One teaspoon of oil gives us five grams of fat, but that sugar offers 20 calories, whereas the fat offers 45. So carbohydrates, of which sugar falls under, are going to offer, offer us 4 calories per gram. Fat is going to offer us 9. So it's going to be more calorically dense. Doesn't mean it's not healthy. And when we're looking at K 
calories, what we aim to strive for when we're thinking about health and maintaining our weight is calorie balance. So on one side, we have the food that we take in. And on the other side, we have the energy that we expend. And I'm going to break these down even further in a minute. And if this becomes imbalanced, where we intake more food than we expend, this will lead to weight gain. That could be in the form of fat or muscle, depending on how you're moving your body. If we expend more energy than we take in, that will lead to weight loss, at least in the short term. And if we're pretty much isocaloric, meaning that we expend and consume about the same amount of calories day to day, we will maintain our weight. And I just want to say that this isn't a um, daily budget. So it's not like if you need 2,000 calories a day, and I'm just making that up. If you need 2,000 calories a day to function, if you have 3,000 one day, that all of a sudden you're going to gain weight. Your body may, very well may regulate so that you only have 1,500 for two days after that if you're in tune with its signals, which we'll talk about in our next section. So this is kind of an overtime balance, not a day-to-day, -day, a minute-to-minute, -minute, or bite-by-bite -bite balance, which is one reason why eating later at night does not magically lead to weight gain. So people often say, you have to stop eating at 8 p.m. because you're not burning calories then, or you're not moving your body then. And as you'll see in a minute, you are still burning calories, but it doesn't matter when you're burning the calories compared to when you're eating the calories, so long as they relatively balance out over time. So let's look more specifically. I'm sorry this is a little fuzzy. This is the best picture I could get. Let's look a little more specifically at calories in and calories out. What two things, or what three things go to each side. So on the calories inside, this is your intake. Well, we already talked about the three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And we're going to dive even more deeply into them in a second. And alcohol also falls in there if you choose to consume it. On the other side, we have three different ways that you expend energy, that you burn calories. The top one says RMR, which stands for resting metabolic rate. The next one is physical activity, and the bottom one is TEF, which is thermic effect of feeding. You most definitely want to write these down. So let's talk about each one. RMR, resting metabolic rate, is the coolest thing. It is your metabolism at rest. If you literally laid in bed all day and didn't move, that's how many calories your body would burn in a day. And this is the ca calories that it costs to beat your heart, to pump your blood, to break down old tissue and build new tissue, to create hormones, to think. So cool. All the things that, that require functioning in your body to keep you warm. And the we'll, we'll talk about what percentages for each one in a second. The next one, physical activity, includes all physical movement. It's not just things like running or cycling or weightlifting or dancing. It's all movement that you do. So it's rolling over in bed. It's brushing your teeth. It's walking to class. All physical movement counts. Physical exercise is just a subset. And then the other subset is something called NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is just all the other movement that you do outside of structured exercise. And then the last one, TEF, thermic effect of feeding, is just a measure for the calories that you burn to digest your food. Yes, it does actually cost you calories to get the calories from your food. So let's talk about percentages for each one. RMR, resting metabolic rate, is going to take up about 60 to 70 percent of your total daily energy expenditure. So the vast majority of the energy that you're burning in a day is just the amount of energy that it takes to survive. So again, let's say you burn 2,000 calories in a day. Random guess. 1,200 to 1,400 of those calories are just going to surviving. So what does that tell you? If you are trying to lose weight for some reason and you cut your calories down that low, surviving is going to be hard to do. And your body's going to make some adjustments so surviving's easier by way of slowing down your metabolism, making you colder, shutting down some, some fundamental processes so that your body can stay alive. 
So RMR is very important. We want to keep that one high. Physical activity, depending on how, um, how active you are, is going to be about 20 to 30% of your daily movement or your daily expenditure. Um, obviously, the more active you are, the higher that number is and less is going to your RMR, the less active, lower that number is. And then finally, thermic effect of feeding is about 10%. So really, RMR is the big guns here. That's where the vast majority of our caloric expenditure is going to, and that's something that we want to keep high. And in our next lesson, we'll talk about things that we might inadvertently do to drop that number. So again, if you're looking for weight maintenance, generally balancing how much is going out versus how much is coming in is useful. And weight maintenance um, is not the only benefit of balancing. It's also useful for health over time, so long as you're also eating nutritious foods. So now you're probably wondering, well, how many calories do I burn in a day? What, what is my energy expenditure? So you can go to the lab and actually get this tested by having the amount of oxygen you consume and carbon dioxide you breathe out measured. However, that costs money. It can be hard to find. It's not very practical. You can find some various formulas, two of which are called the mifflin saint Jor or the Harris-Benedict equation. And you can find them used here at the Institute of Medicine Estimated Energy Requirements website or the TDEE calculator website. This one is obviously hosted by the government, so that's a more useful one to go off of. This one is not. Um, however, for some people, this IOM one seems a bit high, so you'll have to take it with a grain of salt. It isn't perfect, but I'm going to give you an example here. So this is what the website looks like. You type it in or if you click it. So they use a couple of these different equations to figure out what you need. It says it's based on the 2005 Dietary Guidelines for Americans. Um, using some of these equations before, which ones they've used in the past. So I'll use myself for example. Female, put your age in, you'll put your height in, you'll put your weight in. You can use the metric or conventional systems. And then you're going to put an activity level in. So they have examples here. If you're sedentary, low active, active, or very active. So you can read through those on your own. Put in active. And then you'll calculate. So you'll scroll down and tell you these things. And then based on the information you input, it's estimating that I need 2,400 calories a day to maintain my weight. 2,400 calories a day. So it seems fairly reasonable. For some people, they, that's high if they've ever tracked before. Um, however, I think it may just be that people underestimate when they're tracking calories. So this is an example that you'll use in your next assignment um, when determining the calories that you need to track for a few days, which I ask you to do, and then compare it to another practice. So that's one thing you can try to determine how many calories you need. And then you kind of have to determine what percentage of those calories should go to protein, carbohydrates, and fats. And here are some examples that we've seen again. So let's talk about a few of these. Carbs, proteins, and fats. The AMDR, the Acceptable Macronutrient Distribution Range for Carbohydrates, is 45 to 65% of your total daily calories. Protein is 10 to 35, big range. Fat is 20 to 35. So it varies depending on the person and their goal. Let's look at carbs. If you're a very active individual, having near the higher end of the range is going to be most beneficial. If you're a less active individual, having near the lower end of the range is going to be most beneficial. And I like to think of carbs, group them as foods from the ground, right? Grains, veggies, fruits, potatoes, etc foods from the ground. These can be made into foods that don't look like they're from the ground, like chips, cakes, and candies. <laughs> those fall into carbs too, um, but those are our primary carbohydrate foods. So what are some of the roles in the body? Energy source big time. So carbohydrates are one of our primary energy foods, especially during high intensity exercise. They are the primary fuel source for our brain. So all carbohydrates get broken down to a molecule called glucose, 
and glucose is the preferred fuel source that our brain uses and the only one that it uses outside of periods of starvation or a diet with no carbohydrates. They also offer an abundance of fiber, which we'll get into, vitamins, and minerals. So some things to know about carbohydrates, complex versus simple carbs, fiber and what it is, and then how carbohydrates and sugar impact our blood sugar. We'll go into each of those in a minute. Protein, 10 to 35%. We often think of this as from animals, but also plants. So we have our meat foods, our poultry, our fish, eggs, and then we also have things like tofu, beans, some vegetables, dairy. Protein has so many roles in the body. It builds up all of your body tissue. So we often think of muscle as coming from protein, but so too does bone and cartilage and ligament and tendon and skin and all of these other um, tissues in our bodies. It acts as a transporter for substances around our blood, so it carries things like cholesterol or oxygen around our blood. Protein forms many hormones, neurotransmitters like serotonin, um, which is of importance, as you might recall, that it is related to mood, enzymes that speed up chemical reactions, and it's a big part of our immune system, immune health and functioning. Things to know about protein that we'll dive into. Complete versus incomplete proteins. Well, let's look at fats. Fats should make up 20 to 35% of your total daily calories, 20% being a minimum for health. And you'll see why in a minute. It also comes from animals and plants. So you get this from fatty meats, from fatty fish, from eggs, from full fat dairy, and also plants like avocados, olives, the oils made from those foods, coconuts, nuts, and seeds. The primary roles of fat in the body, hormone production and function, huge for this. So if you're not getting a minimum of 20% of your total daily calories from fats, your hormone function is gonna suffer. And your hormones run everything from your metabolism to your sex drive, to the renewal of your skin and your hair, to much, much more. Fat is also another primary energy source it helps with vitamin absorption for certain vitamins, and it helps to build all of our cell wall structures. Things to know about fat, we have a couple different kinds, saturated, unsaturated, and trans fatty acids, and then two of particular importance because they're what are called essential fats, and these are omega-3 and omega-6. We'll go into each of these on their own. So really quickly, going back to protein, 10 to 35 is a big range. So should you have at the lower or the higher end? Well, general health, probably somewhere in the middle, but if you're an exerciser or you are looking to build muscle, maybe slightly higher towards the higher end, and then fats, it'll just be inversely related to carbs. So if you eat a high carb diet, the lower end of the fats will then be most appropriate. If you eat a low carb diet, the higher end of the fats is most appropriate, so you're getting enough calories. But somewhere in the middle is probably fine for all of them. Before we go into those specifics, I want to cover a concept called nutrient density versus calorie density. So nutrient density means that a food packs a lot of nutrition per unit of energy or per calorie, basically. Calorie density is the exact opposite. Calorie density means that a food packs a lot of calories while offering few vitamins and minerals. So it'd be great if you just stopped the tape here for a second and thought about some examples in each of those categories. What are foods that offer a lot of nutrition, but little energy or less energy and foods that offer a lot of energy, but little nutrition. So some examples of very nutrient dense foods are things like leafy greens. Most of our vegetables are going to fall into this category. They give us a lot of vitamins and minerals, things that help our body run well, but not very many calories. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have calorie density. These foods are going to be things like cakes, cookies, pies, chips, um, snack and convenience foods, um, processed breads and pastas, etc., where they're going to offer us calories, but very little by way of nutrition. So ideally, for the vast majority of us, we want to be getting most of our foods from nutrient-dense sources, 
and that typically looks like whole foods. So, like I said, vegetables, fruits will fall into this category. Um, and then you have foods that are kind of in between, like meats and oils and um, nuts and seeds that are still going to offer a good amount of calories, but they're also going to offer a good amount of nutrients. So the example over here on the right, you have this one big kebab wrap, or you might think of like a California burrito <laughs> at 1,600 calories, but one meal and not a lot of nutrition compared to a full day of eating what looks like a egg frittata situation and maybe some yogurt and berries and oats and fruit and a salad, etc. And, and, and it's real food, and it doesn't mean that you're just eating plain chicken breast and broccoli all day. But because it's nutrient-dense, more whole food, you're getting more bang for your bite, buck or bite. Below, you can also see another example, a few small starbursts, which probably aren't going to go a big way in filling up space in your belly and keeping you full, are the same amount of calories as a banana. Now, I just want to say that this doesn't mean you can never have fun foods like kebabs or burritos or pizza or starburst. It just means that it's something you want to balance out. So you're getting more nutrient density too, and that means you're getting more micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, which are essential for healthy functioning. Cool. So let's talk about some of the things around carbs. So we have complex versus simple carbohydrates, or high quality versus low quality, some might say. So high quality or complex are going to be Carbohydrates that are in their more natural form that have a branched chain structure. So again, things like fruits and vegetables, tubers like potatoes, sweet potatoes and squash, and real whole grain bread. On the opposite side, we have things like processed carbs, pasta, white pasta, white bread, soda, donuts, cookies, candy. Um, and the reason this matters, why does carb quality matter? is that high quality carbs are gonna have more fiber, which we'll talk about in a minute, and they're gonna have more vitamins and minerals, and they're gonna have a smaller impact on your blood sugar, which is a good thing over time. So this can seem easy sometimes, you're like, cool, I'll just grab the thing that says whole wheat. However, if you compare the ingredient list for something like Ezekiel bread to this random honey, whole, honey wheat whole grain bread, if the bread doesn't say 100% whole wheat on it, it's probably not. And so if you look at the ingredient list on the back, it'll usually say enriched flour. Anytime you see enriched, it means that it's been processed and the vitamins, minerals, and fiber have been removed. And then a synthetic form has been added back in. Your body doesn't do as well with synth synthetic as it does with the real stuff. It's had hundreds of thousands of years of um, history to adapt to the real stuff hundred or fewer to adapt to the fake stuff. So it's harder for your body to deal with. So that's one thing to consider with carbs. Also, the complex carbs are going to have more fiber. You have two different types of fiber, soluble and insoluble. Soluble just means it breaks down in water and, and breaks down in your body. Insoluble means it kind of stays in its form as it passes through your digestive system. Both are great. Both are crucial. So soluble fiber, think of things that break down in water like oats, peas, fruit, beans. These things are gonna help lower your cholesterol and blood sugar. So that's why if you see a bowl of um, Quaker oats, it says part of a heart healthy diet. That's because it has soluble fiber, which research shows lowers cholesterol. If you look at the insoluble fiber side, you see vegetables, whole grains, nuts, and often the skin of fruits. These are things that are not as easily going to break down in water. These are going to help bulk up your stool and help food move through your digestive system, as well as feeding your gut bacteria. And we have trillions of gut bacteria. We actually have um, the cells of gut bacteria in our body outnumber our human cells by 10 to 1, which is astounding. And they have a very big impact on our physical, mental, and emotional health. So having a healthy, diverse gut bacteria is very important. So eating foods from both of these categories is essential for good health. Looking at proteins, complete versus incomplete proteins. We said before, 
So we have 20 different amino acids in proteins, which are just the building blocks of protein. Think of them like little Legos of different shapes. And some of these amino acids are considered essential because your body cannot manufacture them on, their, on your, its own. So a complete protein is one that's high in all essential amino acids. And there are, depending on the text that you look at, eight or nine essential amino acids. We'll go with eight. So these are going to be foods that come from animal products, typically. Meat, eggs, dairy, and one non-animal product, which is soy. So like soybeans or tofu or tempeh are all going to be complete proteins. Incomplete proteins are foods that have protein, but they're low in one or more essential amino acid. And it's essential because you need it. So these are going to be our plant-based proteins. So beans, grains, vegetables. And protein complementation was this idea that you could pair um, grain or you could pair foods that were low in different amino acids and eat them together to get a full spectrum. So like you had to eat beans and rice together. And research suggests that you don't have to do this so long as you get a wide variety of protein, incomplete protein foods throughout the day if you're not eating complete protein. So that's one thing to consider. And finally, fats, different types of fats. We'll briefly cover this. We have saturated, unsaturated, trans, and omega-3 and 6s are a particular form of unsaturated fats that are useful. So saturated fats are simply fats that are solid at room temperature. They have a chemical structure that makes them solid at room temperature. So that's like the fat in a cut of meat, cream, butter, cheese, right? All those foods are going to be solid at room temperature. It used to be thought that high amounts of saturated fat led to coronary heart disease. There's some research that calls this into question, so the data is sort of up in the air right now. However, it's still probably best to limit or moderate the amount of saturated fat that you get for now with the data that we see. Unsaturated fats are typically considered the healthier kinds of fats. These are often plant fats or fish fats. So things like nuts, avocado, olive, olive oil, salmon, seeds like flax or chia, etc. And these fats are going to help improve our cholesterol, actually. And a subset, two specific kinds of fatty acids that we see in unsaturated fat is omega-3 and omega-6. Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory and omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. So we, while we need both in our diet, we generally want more omega-3. And you find that from some of the foods listed below, particularly fatty fish, walnuts, eggs, um, flaxseed, chia seed, things like that. So getting an abundance of these foods is very, very good for our health. And then lastly, we see trans fats. And you can see by the picture, these probably aren't the best. Trans fats are typically man-made fats where they've taken unsaturated fats and done a process called hydrolyzed. They've hydrolyzed them, meaning they've taken these liquid fats and made them solid. And this was because back in the day they thought, ooh, saturated fat's real bad for you, but people kind of like the taste. So we should just take unsaturated fat and make it solid. And we found that this, in fact, is very, very bad for health. So you see it in most packaged and processed foods, like burgers and onion rings and donuts and chips. And in fact, a label can say it has no trans fat if it has 0.5 grams or less. But that's per serving. So let's say you're eating a bag of chips with six servings in it, and it actually has 0.5 grams per serving, and you eat the whole thing, now you've gotten three grams of trans fat. Trans fat has a huge correlation to cardiovascular disease. So this is not something we want to be consuming much of. So more of these, moderate amounts of these, very little of this. Couple specific topics. One is sugar. So high sugar consumption in the diet is related to things like increased inflammation, reduced insulin sensitivity, potentially fat gain, although it has to be in the context of excess calories, diabetes, 
accelerated aging, etc. So reduced insulin sensitivity. Sugar spikes your, the sugar in your blood, which spikes a hormone called insulin, which tries to store that sugar away. Over time, if your blood sugar and your insulin are too high, your body cells stop responding to it and they become insensitive to insulin, which can lead to diabetes. Inflammation is the underlying process for all chronic disease. Things like diabetes, but also heart disease, cancer, um, a lot of chronic pain conditions, etc. So sugar can go around and wreak a bit of havoc in the body. Where do we find it? Well, we find it in most packaged foods, for sure. And we do find some naturally occurring in our diet, things like fruits and vegetables, but that kind of sugar is okay. We just don't want a ton of it added in. Most health organizations recommend that less than 10%, so a small fraction of your total daily calories come from sugar. So where do we find these things? Often we think, again, cakes, cookies, donuts, but in our modern food environment, it is hiding everywhere. Granola bars, protein bars, juice, dressings, bread will have added sugar. Yogurt, which can be such a healthy food, oftentimes it has added sugar if it's a flavor. Barbecue sauce or ketchup or prepackaged sandwiches. Naked juice or other juices, the big offender. These two right here, Starbucks drinks and naked juices. A naked juice green machine, which you might be thinking, cool, is a bunch of veggies pushed into a bottle, actually has nearly double the amount of sugar as a can of Coke. Orange juice will have the same or more sugar than a can of Coke. A yogurt can easily have more sugar than a Snickers bar. So does it mean that you can never eat these things? Of course not. But we don't want to be eating them thinking that we're doing something good for our health when in fact we're getting more sugar than a Coke or a Snickers, which we might not choose to eat at that time. So generally speaking, to avoid excess sugar, you want to eat foods in their most natural forms, and you want to check your labels. So you certainly can find yogurt without added sugar. You certainly can find dressings without added sugar. Typically, these are not going to be light dressings. So oftentimes, if they take the fat out, they're putting the sugar in. So a good rule of thumb is to check your label and aim for 5 to 10 or fewer grams of sugar per serving, unless this is something like a dessert where you're choosing to have sugar. But if you're just having like a breakfast sandwich or a yogurt or putting some dressing on your salad, that's not the place you want to be adding the sugar in. And just for reference, one can of Coke has 10 teaspoons, 10 teaspoons of the white stuff. So many of these foods have more than that. Can you imagine heaping 10 teaspoons into a cup and drinking it? Yikes. Something to consider. Again, doesn't mean you can never have sugar and you can never enjoy it. In fact, telling yourself to never have sugar is a great way to eventually binge on sugar, but it just means choose your sugar wisely and enjoy it when you have it. Lastly, let's talk about trans fatty acids a little bit more. Like I said, they're unsaturated fats made to act like saturated fats, so solid, and these are very, very unhealthy. They raise our LDL cholesterol, which is our sticky cholesterol that increases the risk of heart disease and make them smaller and stickier. They reduce our HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol that lowers our risk of heart disease, and they increase general systemic inflammation. We also find some other tricky fats in vegetable oils. These are a processed form of unsaturated fats called PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And you can find these all over. So think of things like canola oil, um, corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, any kind of seed oil. And where do you find these things? Well, a lot of these same foods, right? A lot of your packaged foods, bars, dressings, um, chips, popcorn, a lot of your packaged foods are going to have these. And these are very challenging for our body to deal with because they, again, are not a natural food our body is aware of. So when we're looking for oils, we typically want to be using things that are nicer on our body that have different kinds of fatty acids. So things like avocado oil, olive oil, coconut oil are all good options. 
So that's it for today. And some things I want you to consider based on today's lesson. What does healthy eating mean to you? Why does it matter? How does this fit into the context of your life? Do you eat enough food to fuel your lifestyle, to make you feel energized, and to promote your health? This means not too much and not too little. And I don't need you to count calories to do this. Just pay attention to the food you eat and how you feel. Do you get a variety of healthy carbohydrates, proteins, and fats throughout the day? And where are hidden sugars and trans fats hiding in your diet? that you might be able to cut down on. All right, thanks for tuning in, and I will see you soon, well, talk to you soon, as it were, when we talk about psychology of eating. Bye.